Right, we'll just pick up where we left off. It's coming, treasure, Mrs. Wormwood called from the kitchen. Matilda kept her face bent low over her cornflakes. She didn't dare look up. In the first place, she wasn't at all sure what she was going to see. And secondly, if she did see what she thought she was going to see, she wouldn't trust herself to keep a straight face. The sun was looking directly ahead out of the window, stuffing himself with bread and peanut butter and strawberry jam. The father was just moving around to sit at the head of the table when the mother came sweeping out from the kitchen, carrying a huge plate piled high with eggs and sausages and bacon and tomatoes. She looked up. She caught sight of her husband. She stopped dead. Then she let out a scream that seemed to lift her right up in the air and she dropped the plate with a crash and a splash on the floor. Everyone jumped, including Mr. Wormwood. What the heck's the matter with you, woman? He shouted. Look at the mess you've made on the carpet. Your hair, the mother was shrieking, pointing to a quivering finger, finger at her husband. Look at your hair. What have you done to your hair? What's wrong with my hair, for heaven's sake, he said. Oh my God, Dad, what have you done to your hair, the son shouted. A splendid noisy scene was building up nicely in the breakfast room. Matilda said nothing. She simply sat there admiring the wonderful effect of her own handiwork. Mr. Wormwood's fine crop of black hair was now to dirty silver, the colour this time of a tightrope walker's tights that had not been washed for the entire circuit season. You've, you've, you've dyed it, shrieked the mother. Why did you do it, you fool? It looks absolutely frightful. It looks horrendous. You look like a freak. What the blazes are you all talking about? The father yelled, putting both hands to his hair. I most certainly have not dyed it. What do you mean I've dyed it? What's happened to it? Or is this some sort of a stupid joke? His face was turning pale green, the colour of sour apples. You must have dyed it, Dad, the son said. It's the same colour as Mum's, only much dirtier looking. Of course he's dyed it, the mother cried. He can't change colour all by itself. What on earth were you trying to do, making yourself, make yourself look handsome or something? You look like someone's grandmother gone wrong. Get me a mirror, the father yelled. Don't just stand there shrieking at me. Get me a mirror. The mother's handbag lay on a chair at the other end of the table. She opened the bag and got out a powder compact that had a small round mirror on the side of the lid. She opened the compact and handed it to her husband. He grabbed it and held it before his face and, in doing so, spilled most of the powder all over the front of his fancy tweed jacket. Be careful, shrieked the mother. Now look what you've done. That's my best Elizabeth Arden face powder. Oh my God, yelled the father, staring into the little mirror. What's happened to me? I look terrible. I look like you, gone wrong. I can't go down to the garage and sell cars like this. How did it happen? He stared around the room, first at the mother, then at the son, then at Matilda. How could it have happened, he yelled. I imagine, Daddy, Matilda said quietly, that you weren't looking very hard and you simply took Mummy's bottle of hair stuff off the shelf instead of your own. Of course that's what's happened, the mother cried. Well, really, Harry, how stupid can you get? Why didn't you read the label before you started splashing the stuff all over you? Mine's terribly strong. I'm only meant to use one tablespoon of it in a whole basin of water and you've gone and put it all over your head neat. It'll probably take all your hair off in the end. Is your scalp beginning to burn, dear? You mean I'm going to lose all my hair, the husband yelled. I think you will, the mother said. Peroxide is a very powerful chemical. It's what they put down the lavatory to disinfect the pan, only they give it another name. What are you saying, the husband cried. I'm not a lavatory pan. I don't want to be disinfected. Even diluted, like I use it, the mother told him. It makes a good deal of my hair fall out. So goodness knows what's going to happen to you. I'm surprised it didn't take the whole of the top of your head off. What shall I do, wailed the father. Tell me quick what to do before it starts falling out. Matilda said, I'd give it a good wash, Dad, if I were you, with soap and water, but you'll have to hurry. Will that change the colour back? The father asked anxiously. Of course he won't, you twit, the mother said. Then what do I do? I can't go around looking like this forever. You'll have to have it dyed black, the mother said, but wash it first or there won't be any to dye. Right, the father shouted, springing into action. Get me an appointment with your hairdresser this instant for a hair dyeing job. Tell him it's an emergency. They've got to boot someone else off, off the list or off the list. I'm going upstairs to wash it now. With that, the man dashed out of the room and Mrs. Wormwood, sighing deeply, went to the telephone to call the beauty parlour. He does do some pretty silly things now and then, 
doesn't he, Mummy? Matilda said. The mother, dialing the number on the phone, said, I'm afraid men are not always quite as clever as they think you are. Well, you will learn that when you get a bit older, my girl. Miss Honey. Matilda was a little late in starting school. Most children began primary school at five or even just before, but Matilda's parent, who, parents, who weren't very concerned one way or the other about their daughter's education, had forgotten to make the proper arrangements in advance. She was five and a half when she entered school for the first time. The village school for younger children was a bleak building called Crincham Hall Primary School. It had about 250 pupils aged from five to just under 12 years old. The head teacher, the boss, the supreme commander of this establishment, was a formidable middle-aged lady whose name was Miss Trenchbull. Naturally, Matilda was put in the bottom class where there were 18 other small boys and girls about the same age as her. The teacher was called Miss Honey and she could not have been more than 23 or 24. She had a lovely pale over Madonna face with blue eyes and her hair was light brown. Her body was so slim and fragile, one got the feeling that if she ever fell over, she would smash into a thousand pieces like a porcelain figure. Miss Jennifer Honey was a mild and quiet person who never raised her voice and was seldom seen to smile. But there is no doubt she possessed that rare gift for being adored by every small child under her care. She seemed to understand totally the bewilderment and fear that so often overwhelm young children who for the first time in their lives are herded into a classroom and told to obey orders. Some curious warmth that was almost tangible shone out from Miss Honey's face when she spoke to a confused and homesick newcomer to the class. Miss Trunchbull, the headmistress, was something else altogether. She was a gigantic holy terror, a fierce tyrannical monster who frightened the life out of pupils and teachers alike. There was an aura of menace about her even at a distance. When she came up close you could almost feel the dangerous heat radiating from her as from a red hot rod of metal. When she marched, Miss Trunchbull never walked. She always marched like a stormtrooper with long strides and arms swinging. When she marched along a corridor you could actually hear her snorting as she went. And if a group of children happened to be in her path she ploughed right on through them like a tank with small people bouncing off her to left and right. Thank goodness we don't meet many people like her in this world. Although they do exist and all of us are likely to come across at least one of them in a lifetime. If you ever do, you should behave as, if, as you would if you met an enraged rhinoceros out in the bush. Climb up the nearest tree and stay there until it has gone away. This woman, in all her eccentricities and in her appearance, is almost impossible to describe. But I shall make some attempt to do so a little later on. Let us leave her for the moment and go back to Matilda on her first day in Miss Honey's class. After the usual business of going through all the names of the children, Miss Honey handed out a brand new exercise book to each pupil. You have all put your own pencils, I hope, she said. Yes, Miss Honey, they chanted. Good. Now this is the very first day of school for each one of you. It is the beginning of at least 11 young, long years of schooling that all of you are going to have to go through. And six of those years will be spent right here at Crincham Hall, where, as you know, your headmistress is Miss Trunchbull. Let me, for your own good, tell you something about Miss Trunchbull. She insists upon strict discipline throughout the school, and if you take my advice, you will do your very best to behave yourselves in her presence. Never argue with her, never answer her back, always do if she says. If you get on the wrong side of Miss Trunchbull, she can liquidise you like a carrot in a kitchen blender. It's nothing to laugh about, Lavender. Take that grin off your face. All of you will be wise to remember that Miss Trunchbull deals very, very severely with anyone who goes out of line in the school. Have you got the message? Yes, Miss Honey, chirped 18 eager little voices. I, myself, Miss Honey went on, want to help you to learn as much as possible while you are in this class. That is because I know it will make things easy for you later on. For example, by the end of this week, I shall expect every one of you to know the two times table by heart. And in a year's time, I hope you will know all the multiplication tables up to 12. It will help you enormously if you do. Now then, do any of you happen to have learnt the two times table already? Matilda put up a hand. She was the only one. Miss Honey looked carefully at the tiny girl with dark hair and a round, serious face sitting up at the second row. Wonderful, she said. Please stand up and recite of it as much as you can. Matilda stood up and began to say the two times table. When she got to 
twice 12 is 24 she didn't stop she went right on with twice uh, thri twice 13 is 26 twice 14 is 28 twice 15 is 30 twice 16 is stop miss and he said she had been listening slightly spellbound to this smooth recital now she said how far can you go how far matilda said well i don't really know miss honey but quite a long way i think miss honey took a few moments to let this curious statement sink in you mean she said that you could tell me what two times 28 is yes miss honey what is it 56 miss honey what about something much harder like two times 487 could you tell me that i think so yes matilda said are you sure why yes miss honey i'm fairly sure what is it then two times 487 974 matilda said immediately she spoke quietly and politely and without any sign of showing off miss honey gazed at matilda with absolutely with absolute amazement but when next she spoke she kept her voice level that is really splendid she said but of course multiplying by two is a lot easier than some of the bigger numbers what about the other multiplication tables do you know any of those i think so miss honey i think i do which ones matilda how far have you got i uh, i don't quite know matilda said i don't know what you mean what i mean is do you for instance know the three times table yes miss honey and the four times yes miss honey well how many do you know miss matilda do you know all the way up to the 12 times table? Yes, Miss Honey. What are 12 sevens? 84, Matilda said. Miss Honey paused and leaned back in a chair behind the plain table that stood in the middle of the floor in front of the class. She was considerably shaken by this exchange, but took care not to show it. She had never come across a five-year-old before, or indeed a ten-year-old who, who could multiply with such facility. I hope the rest of you are listening to this, she said to the class. Matilda is a very lucky girl. She has wonderful parents who have already taught her to multiply lots of num numbers. Was it your mother, Matilda, who taught you? No, Miss Honey, it wasn't. You must have a great father then. He must be a brilliant teacher. No, Miss Honey, Matilda said quietly. My father did not teach me. You mean you taught yourself? I don't quite know, Matilda said truthfully. It's just that I don't find, very diff find it very difficult to multiply one number by another. Miss Honey took a deep breath and let it out slowly. She looked again at the small girl with bright eyes standing beside a desk so sensible and solemn. You say you don't find it difficult to multiply one number by another, Miss Honey said. Could you try to explain that a little? Oh dear, Matilda said. I'm not really sure. Miss Honey waited. The class was silent, all listening. For instance, Miss Honey said, if I ask you to multiply 14 by 19, no, that's too difficult. It's 266, Matilda said softly. Miss Honey stared at her. Then she picked up a pencil and quickly worked out the sum on a piece of paper. What did you say it was, she said, looking up. 266, Matilda said. Miss Honey put down her pencil and removed her spectacles and began to polish the lenses with a piece of tissue. The class remained quiet, watching her and waiting for what was coming next. Matilda was still standing up beside her desk. Now tell me, Matilda, Miss Honey said, still polishing. Try to tell me exactly what goes on inside your head when you get multiplication like that you do, like that to do. You obviously have to work it out in some way, but you seem to be able to arrive at the answer almost instantly. Take the one you've just done, 14 multiplied by 19. I, I, I simply put the 14 down in my head and multiply it by 19, Matilda said. I'm afraid I don't know how else to explain it. I've always said to myself that if a little pocket calculator can do it, why shouldn't I? Why not indeed, Miss Honey said. The human brain is an amazing thing. I think it's a lot better than a lump of metal, Matilda said. That's all a calculator is. How right you are, Miss Honey said. Pocket calculators are not allowed in this school anyway. Miss Honey was feeling quite quivery. There was no doubt in her mind that she had met a truly extraordinary mathematical brain and words like child genius and prodigy went flitting through her head. She knew that these sorts of wonders do pop up in the world from time to time, but only once or twice in a hundred years. After all, Mozart was only five when he started composing for the piano, and look what happened to him. It's not fair, Lavender said. How can she do it and we can't? Right, we'll stop there because it's the natural ending of the page, and we'll pick this up next week. I hope you enjoyed it, children.